An American kidnapped and threatened with word death by on an American journalist held hostage. A photographer from New York was taken hostage by a splinter group. Insurgent hideouts and go abducted from this marketplace. And so it's you know it's kind of like this. Everything is happening in a matter of seconds. Or, you know, it's, it's so much is happening at once. People are shouting. People are getting involved. You know, my translator was you know speaking a mile a minute, trying to keep everyone calm, um, you know, doing his best to de-escalate. De I was doing my best to try to disappear, you know, get out of there as quickly as possible because, you know, I was the source of this um, problem for everybody. You know, the, the, the anger was all beginning, you know, focusing on me. But it was one of those things that compounds itself. Barack. It's the summer of 2004. The U.S.-led coalition was fighting a war on two fronts. The Sunni insurgency in the north and the Shiite uprising in the south, led by Muqtada al-Sadr. It was also during that extraordinarily hot summer that the coalition transitioned authority back to an ill-trained, ill-equipped, and unprepared Iraqi security force, a move that created a void of power in the region that insurgents, outlaw gangs, and fundamentalists quickly filled. The country of Iraq was spiraling into chaos. You know, people rush over to see what the problem is, you know, and, and the, the anger and the fear and all, the hostility, it all just builds on itself. And, and you could tell that, you know, at, there's nothing, I mean, it would, it would make no difference to anyone to kill somebody in that moment. You know, it's not like that is something they, that they're concerned about in that moment. You know, you're talking about a war zone and their concern that I am, you know, somebody who is an enemy. That's what they're thinking in their heads suddenly. Like, who is this guy? What's going on? And so killing your enemy in a war zone. That's yeah. what you do. <laughs> That's what you do. That's Micah Guerin, a documentarian, journalist, and friend. He's agreed to come onto the show and talk with me about the 10 days during that summer that he was held hostage. Since co-authoring the book, American Hostage, a memoir of a journalist kidnapped in Iraq, and the remarkable battle to win his release, this is the first interview he's given about the ordeal. And for this, I'm incredibly grateful. American Hostage tells the story of Micah's abduction from two points of view. His, and that of his partner, now wife, Marie Helene Carlton, who, with a cohort of friends and family, moved heaven and earth to secure his release. It's good. Read it. But this episode is not about the book. It's about Micah, a man who for 10 days looked death in the face and how it has affected his life ever since. Please join me for episode five of The Adventures of Memento Mori, Escaping Death. From the Jones Story Company, this is The Adventures of Memento Mori, a cynic's guide for learning to live by remembering to die. The podcast that explores mortality. Here's your host, D.S. Moss. Micah Garrett and Marie Helen Carlton are a filmmaking wonder team who had spent months filming a documentary about the archaeological looting of Iraq because of the war. The filming had come to an end. Almost. All but a couple of interviews and potentially dangerous contextual B-roll shots. It's funny because when you're in these situations or when you're when you're doing a project where there's elements of it that are dangerous, you know are dangerous, you always tend to put those off to later. With the reassurance from Micah, Marie Helene went home while he stayed for a couple more days to get those shots. And it's only in those last moments, I always warn other filmmakers and journalists about this, don't do what you put off to the last couple of days, just don't ever do it. Because you, psychologically, you put off the most dangerous things until the last few days. And you don't realize that, but you don't do them earlier because they're so dangerous. On Friday, the 13th of August, 2004, Micah, accompanied with his friend and interpreter, Amir, went to a market just outside of Nasiriya to discreetly capture footage of gun sellers at the market. Just a few background shots of a gun market. After a cautious approach, Micah and Amir gained enough trust from one of the gun sellers and nervously began filming. They moved on to the next vendor. But something about this one didn't feel right to Micah so he kept the small digital camera in his pocket and out of sight. Amir assured Mike it was okay to film, and against his instincts, he took a picture. The vendor instantly reacted, 
shouting and causing a scene. He wanted that non-existent roll of film out of the back of that digital camera. The crowd gathered, unsatisfied and now enraged. The vendor loaded a rifle and shot at Amir's feet. Then, with a finger on the trigger, pointed the barrel directly at Micah. My immediate thought was, you can see this situation escalating around you. And my thought was, de-escalate, de-escalate. You know, let's get out of here. Let's kind of move away. I could see where this was suddenly going to get out of hand. With the gun still pointed at him, Micah turns around quickly and begins to walk away. It was only when I was walking away and I was a little bit further from the action that somebody had kept an eye on me and sort of caught up with me and asked me what was wrong. And I, I said, <laughs> Mabarov, which, you know, I don't know. But my accent and the fact that it wasn't, you know, colloquial Iraqi Arabic, you know, it was, he immediately was just, you know, he just started shouting foreigner. You know, he had caught the foreigner. The crowd turned angry mob grab and pull at Micah, tearing at his clothes, taking his wallet and his glasses. With a knife to his throat, he's led to a car and thrown into the back seat along with Amir. The driver and passengers were both armed and it's as frantic as those outside of the car door. You know, there's m multiple moments when you're sort of thinking, oh God, you know, this, this could be the end because this man was really agitated. He was screaming, he was pointing the pistol back at us. And then, you know, they took us to the small office, which was the, the solder office um, right along the river, which is only about a five minute drive. And there, you know, we thought, okay, de-escalate, de-escalate, explain who we are, we're filmmakers, we're journalists. My interpreter, Amir, told me afterwards that he, they were having a conversation between themselves and one of them said, uh, should I get the pistol? Basically meaning, you know, should we just take them out and shoot them? And the other guy said, well, no, they might be telling the truth about, you know, being journalists. So, you know, it's, it's uh, there are multiple <laughs> stages where things kept getting worse and worse and worse. And the, that's when they put the blindfold on us. And that's when they put us in the car and took us for a couple hours. Sitting with their hands tied behind their backs and blindfolded head resting on their knees, Micah and Amir are driven away, leaving no traces behind. You know, this, this question of constantly going on in my head of, am I going to fight? Am I going to negotiate? Am I going to plead? You know, what are you going to do? Which, which strategy is the one that's going to get you out of the situation? So at one point you had, um, you had your, your arms tied behind your back and you had loosened the knots right. and then you were feeling behind you and you felt um, what you thought could be rifles, but instead it was just the, the barrels of the rifle. Right. Um, and then there was an opportunity or at least you, you thought possibly there was an opportunity to then take the barrel of that rifle and then do something with it to the yeah. with to the pass, the, pass, the passenger and and the and the driver. So now you're in contemplating fight mode. This is definitely <laughs> it's the kind of thing, you know, I'm I'm not in any way trained to fight. It's not something I've ever done. So the concept of fighting in that capacity is, is, you know, it's not a real option. It's, it's almost like based on movies, right? It's based like, on movies, it's, but it's, it's a sense of, you know, if this is your last option, if this is the only thing left to you, is to take, you know, this piece of metal that's in my hand and to swing and hit it at somebody, you know, I could do that. But the question in my head was that you know, we talk about escalate and de-escalate. That escalates things, you know, because if you're going to hit them, you got to make you gotta sure you got to do it 100 percent. Yeah. And, you know, that escalates it, you know, a thousand times and it's all or nothing. And this is the, the, the real crux, the terrible thing about being kidnapped in this situation is you don't know what's coming and you're trying to guess at what's coming is what's coming worse then, you know, is, is, which is the worst path to go on? You know, if you know that they're about to shoot you, well then, yeah, you're gonna pick up that metal rod and hit somebody. But if, you, if they're gonna release you in an hour, you've just like signed over your death warrant. Imagine that for a minute. You've been violently abducted, blindfolded, and now are in the backseat of a van heading to your end. Or 
Freedom, perhaps. You don't know. Do you take that swing? Is the way out of this? How do I get out of this? You know, um, you know, is this an opportunity to escape? Is this going to, you know, lead to my death? For the next 10 days, that's what I was wrestling with every minute of the day. Ever wonder what Elvis's last words were, or the most outrageous methods of living forever? Discover titillating tidbits about mortality by visiting the Adventures of Memento Mori YouTube channel and be the slightly odd yet endlessly fascinating conversationalist at your next party. And be sure to stay up to date with the quest for enlightenment on Instagram and Twitter by following at Remember to Die. All of this and more can be found on our site, RememberToDie.com. And now, back to the show. It's still Friday, August 13th. Micah, only a few short days from returning home, now finds himself traveling for hours in the backseat of a van with his hands behind his back, the right grasping the cold metal barrel of an AK-47. Following the advice of Amir, Micah decides not to take that swing. And so, they continued to drive. Kidnapping and killing of Iraqis became a problem after the coalition pulled back earlier that year and video executions of foreigners were a weapon of choice for insurgents trying to terrorize and influence policy. The public beheading of journalist Daniel Pearl and the hanging of contractor Nick Berg were fresh in everyone's mind. If these were militants, it would be a very public and grisly end. The van finally stopped. Two armed guards led Micah and Amir, barefoot and blindfolded, across the field into a small, dark, dense natural enclosure made of date palm trees. This would be their prison. You know, I tried to write a message, you know, which was MH for Marie Helene, Zug for our dog, Zugma, and then love. And I used a, a reed and mud to write it on the back of a cigarette pack and then put it in my pocket. And, you know, that, that's a message, that message was meant as a way of, um, I guess in essence, sort of speaking beyond the dead if I was killed. So, you know, I think one of the hardest things for people in these situations is that you don't know, you know, what's happening to the other person, you know, what they were thinking. Um, you know, as I, I came to understand through this whole experience is that in a sense, it's a lot worse for the people on the outside than it was for me. You know, you're a pawn and you're meant to inflict pain on everyone else out there. For the next five days, an anxious pattern formed. The ritual of meals, guard changes, and the constant insecurity of not knowing what would happen next. So it's, it's nonstop. Yeah. It's, your brain goes into like 30 second mode where your whole world collapses to basically 30 seconds. And all you're doing for the next, for me it was 10 days, is over and over again, what's gonna happen in the next 30 seconds? Is there a way out of this? How do I get out of this? You know, um, you know is this an opportunity to escape? Is this gonna you know, lead to my death? You know, everything is just trying to weigh these options. On the fifth day of captivity, everything changed. In the morning, they just took me without warning, separated me from Amir. They just told me to, to you know, come with them. There were a couple of them with guns, and then they led me to a, uh, a small building that was um, maybe about a five-minute walk from where we were being held. And that building, you know, they had set it up just as you imagined it, the, uh, um, basically a stage set for an execution, you know, with a, um, you know, a camera and about a dozen men standing around with, you know, AKs, and I think one had an RPG. So they had set it up, you know, in that way. And they were wearing hoods, or were they just... Um, they were, there was at least... Some of them had their faces covered, but there were at least a few that didn't. And that, that was obviously very worrying. You know, when somebody doesn't cover their face, it makes you think that... That they're not worried about <laughs> you seeing them. <laughs> exactly. This is the moment that, that you think it's over. It was almost, um, you know, two things going on in your head, in my head. One was, you know, a sense of trying to send good feelings and messages to people out in the world, that calm of like, 
you know, it's okay, everything's okay. Whatever happens, it'll be fine. You know, don't, don't worry about me, everything's fine. You know, that, that in a sense is a, you know, you, 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 maybe it's a sense of acceptance, but that was half my brain. And the other half was, I'm not going down without a fight. Which, how does that translate into to actual action? Is it, is it, do they neutralize each other? Well, it, it, it's, it's about becoming extremely calm and still. You know, in these, in these videos, I was used to two things happening. Um, you know, they, they usually came in pairs, at least up to that point. So one was the warning, and then one was, the next was the execution. So a big part of me thought that maybe this was the warning video. So I was looking for clues as to whether or not this was an execution video, because if it was, then I was gonna fight back. But so there was all this, you know, back and forth in my own mind, like what's actually happening in this moment? Because, you know, this is the thing, they don't tell you. They're not, right. they're not coming in and saying- And this is, this is happening, we, we, we've made this, we've been talking about this thing for five minutes, but this is like, literally like in a 10 second e Yeah, it's very quick. Yeah. It's very quick. And you're, you know, you hardly have time to process what's going on around you. Um, but I had actually, um, you know, when I say fight back, I mean, I, in my, the other half of my brain, I had fashioned a little um, shiv from palm, you know, sharp palm fronds. And that was in my, you know, in my shoe at the moment, you know, so. And so you were thinking, at what point do I reach I was, down and. I was going to grab that and. Something's you know. jugular. <laughs> You know, or I mean, again, it's not something I've ever done, and I'm not <laughs> something I've ever been trained to do. So, you know, God knows. Obviously, it's not going to work, but that was the state of mind. So it ultimately was the, the warning video. Yeah. And so, take me through that like relief process. Just that re that relief. It, it, there's not much relief because it was an intense sense of uh, of anger and humiliation. You know, because what, what I was realizing is that suddenly I had been used and that this video that they're making is being used as, you know, a way of um, hurting people out in the world. They want to create intense fear, you know, particularly in my family. Um, and that was the purpose. This, you know, I was basically being used as a weapon against the rest of the world and my family. So that, that was, you know, there really wasn't a so much of a feeling of relief. It was a feeling of like deep anger and humiliation. Here, I guess here's a moral question that I just thought of. So at the point now you're angry at them, mm -hmm. uh, you feel humiliated. Did that change your moral stance on even, like if you had a chance to, to, to kill them? <laughs> Like now you're, you're, you're a journalist and, and you, are, you are neutral right. and you're trying to tell an empathetic story about um, archaeology and about a country right. um, that America invaded. And now uh, you've been right. brought in and, and, and now you're, you're a part of it. And so does, did your empathy at that point just go out the door and you're like, at, at any <laughs> point, yeah. don't turn your back, don't give me a chance because I, I will now. I, I I'm got, so angry that I, that I will kill you. That idea of attacking somebody, killing somebody, is not in my nature or vocabulary. So it's a very, you know, as you're moving closer and closer to that as your option, it's definitely surreal. And it's, you know, I would have to say what's in your mind may or may not be something that you actually can ever act on. Right. For the next two days, Micah's urge to escape was constant. He and Amir were bonded together as brothers, yet consensus between them never allowed for the right opportunity. And then, like before, without notice, the guards grabbed Micah and led him to the house for the second video. I asked Micah what was going through his mind as he approached the building. And no, no idea, no idea. And again, that was, you know, the whole, you know, I'm gonna have to fight my way out of this. This is the only way at this point. Um, but I don't even think at that point I thought that that was a real option anymore. You know, I think, I think, you know, you kind of get closer and closer to the thought of, well, maybe I'm not, you know, I really am not in control and I can't control my fate. And, um, yeah, so that was probably one of the, one of the moments where, 
you know, still to this day, I probably, of all the 10 days, I have the hardest time understanding what I was actually thinking in that moment as I was walking into that for the second time. It's a bit of a blank. I actually, you know, I, I can't really remember what was going through my mind. And then as he walked through the threshold of the door. It was pretty clear immediately that, you know, when they brought me into the room that this was not going to be an execution video. The reason it was obvious is because they, the way they had set it up, it was more looked like a living room. Same, you know, same building, just, you know. So they set, they did set deck? Yeah, set dressing. They're sending messages to the world. They're sending carefully thought out messages. And this message was? Um, this is a message that they wanted me to read. So they had written it out in sort of, you know, bad handwriting and broken English, but they wanted me to read this message. And, but they actually wanted me to memorize it and say it. And it was, you know, demanding that the U.S. pull forces out of Najaf, um, you know. So that was the message I was supposed to give. Um, and at, at that point, you know, again, when you're fighting back, you're fighting back in little ways. And so for me, you know, at that moment, fighting back was by just throwing in the words, I've been asked to read, you know, to deliver this message. And did they... They, they didn't catch that. From there, Micah and Amir were moved several times over the next few days. Each time they were moved, there were fewer and fewer guards. And at one point it was just Amir and myself and these two young guards sitting out on a, uh, um, a rug out in the middle of the night um, somewhere, God knows where, and there was one AK-47 and it was equidistant between me and that guard. And, you know, I looked over at Amir and I, and I looked back down at that and he just kind of shook his head. And, you know, at that point again, he thought things, had, things were going to be okay. So countless opportunities that... If you, if you call them opportunities. Or, or <laughs> decisions. Countless decisions. And in a way that was, uh, you know... That was the crazy torment because you tried to figure out, you know, is that something you should do? So you bounce from place to place. Yeah. And then you finally end up. Finally end up back where I started, back in the solder office. That's when that, that's where we were released, you know, back into a press conference. So, spoiler alert, Micah lived through it. But how does a traumatic event like this affect someone? Does it change the way they look at life? We ask Micah about this exact thing after this. The Adventures of Memento Mori is an independent podcast, and we could use your support. Shop with us. Go to rememberto.com slash shop and buy some merchandise. Get your entire family a This Could Be My Last Cup of Coffee mug. Or be the first one on your block to sport a Maury Death Yo baby tea. And so another part of this is, like, how has it affected you now? And, and specifically affected you in living? The cliche would be, I have looked into the eyes of death and I've survived and each day I appreciate and will All right. live to its fullest. You know, th this is a question that comes up a lot actually in my, in my own mind is uh, when you get into a situation like that where you, you know, come close to dying potentially. In one sense, my my situation is different than the kind of cliche of, oh, I'm going to change my life because I was in that moment doing exactly what I had always wanted to do. I was in Iraq working on a documentary film about archaeology. That was it. That was, in a sense, that was my life dream. So if you die doing your life dream, you know, what's there to change? But what did impact me in a huge way was the, when I, this near-death experience was something that was felt profoundly by everyone else out in the world. They, they you know, the rest of the world was um, made to feel this loss, probably more than I was. And 
you know, when I got out, it took a long time to sort of process this. I was completely overwhelmed, you know, just inundated with messages from people I hadn't talked to in 15 years in high school. You know, just the amount, the, the impact, kind of the, the love and care and concern from the world was something I wasn't expecting and wasn't used to. Soon after he returned, Michael was at a party in the West Village, and a stranger came up to him and asked him, wow, that was a really incredible experience. You must have been saved for something greater. And I, you know, thought about that. I was like, well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know what to make of that because it, there's this enormous pressure on you that if you survive that, you're going to do something profound. You're going to walk on water. Yeah, that you have been spared. For something tremendously important. Y you know, I, I think that that's, you know, what's tremendously important is understanding what you care about in your life and to try to make sure that you're living that. And that's, that's an ongoing process. That's a difficult process. I mean, you know, coming back to that realization of what, you know, what matters in your life. Are you doing the things that are important? Um, I don't know. I think, I think it's a constant, constant question. So 10 days, your, your adrenaline is being maxed out. Yeah. And post, you've gone back and you go back to really the most... Uh, dangerous areas of conflict um, that there that there's been. So do you find it actually hard? I mean, I wouldn't say things like adrenaline junkie or addicted yeah. to danger, things like that. But I think you've been elevated. Um, is it hard to come down and and be like this? The world, our container now is kind of silly, like because you've you've seen and you you go into to high risk situations and now like are you in the you know waiting for the fucking sea train and be like you know whatever <laughs> well it it is a challenge because in a conflict or post conflict zone there is a heightened sense of importance around everything and we come back to new york and the environment here of like you know picking up your milk you know it it's hard to feel a sense of importance that compares to what you feel in those environments. So that it's not the adrenaline, it's the sense of meaning. And a lot of times I say to myself, you know, that's a bit of an illusion, you know. The sense of meaning or the picking up the milk? You no, know, the sense of meaning in those environments. It's, it's, in, it's not necessarily intrinsic meaning. It's meaning that's created from that conflict environment. And so I always, you know, talk myself down from that sense of meaning. And I try to look for the intrinsic meaning because, you know, there's an, just as much meaning in a William Carlos Williams poem. You know, there's, there's just as much meaning as, you know, in this cup of coffee sitting on the table. And you have to find that meaning wherever you are. And that conflict environment is an easy way to find meaning. Everything seems, it's so heightened. Everything is life or death. But that seems like almost the, hard, the harder practice is, is to find the meaning in the, you know, in the cup of coffee on the table. It is. It's incredibly hard. I mean, and that's, that's more difficult. And I think that's, you know, in a way this, you know, these conflict zones can be a bit of, you know, escapism for people. For me, you know, this, this, conflict is something that I had never, you know, documenting and not, nothing I had ever planned to do. And, you know, after we've been at war for, uh, gosh, almost 15 years now, I'm pulling myself out of that more and more and trying to focus more on the subtleties and beauty of life and art and the William Carlos Williams poem and the coffee cup, because in the end, that's what really matters. I've since started reading a lot of William Carlos Williams. Thanks for joining me on another episode of The Adventures of Memento Mori. Thanks, Micah, for your friendship and sharing your story. In case you forgot, the book is American Hostage, a memoir of a journalist kidnapped in Iraq and the remarkable battle to win his release. Read it. Please visit our website at RememberToDie.com 
and follow us on the social media at Remember to Die. I'm D.S. Moss. Back in two weeks for the next episode with more The Adventures of Memento Mori. The episode was produced by Josh Heilbronner and D.S. Moss, with production help by Bianca Jacarin. Theme music composed by Mikey Ballou. This has been a production of the Jones Story Company. Until the next time, remember to die.